I talk a lot about different paradigms of research, right? Positivism, critical realism, and interpretivism. And part of the reason I do that is that the differences between these paradigms kind of influence everything we do as researchers, right? The choices we make are demonstrative of how we think about these things, right? Um, but it's also important because when you're trying to look at and understand different research, right? Or when you're trying to make choices for yourself about your own research, you kind of need to know what's happening with different paradigms in order to make things make sense. Um, so what I wanna talk about is how different paradigms think about conducting ethical research, right? Research ethics at its foundation is what it sounds like, right? How to conduct research in a way that is not unethical, right? And the reason we have principles around research ethics that are codified as social scientists is because of the horrible harm that has been done to people in the name of research in the name of science, right? We can think about the Tuskegee experiment, right? Where people were knowingly not treated for a disease that had a treatment so that we could get better data about uh, the progression of the disease. We can think about um, the events that led up to the Nuremberg trials and the experimentation on um, Jews and others in concentration camps by the Nazis. Um, we can think about the horrible history of gynecology in uh, the Western world, and in particular, the way that Black women's bodies were treated as expendable, and it was assumed they didn't feel pain, so procedures could be tested on them. Um, for a local Canadian example, we have the history of the MKUltra experiments um, at McGill University, where people with serious mental illness were treated with hallucinogens not just to try to give them better quality of life, but actually to see if they could be subject to brainwashing, right? So we have this whole history of people doing incredibly screwed up stuff, often to people with less social power than them and doing it because of knowledge, right? And so uh, justifiably, there was kind of a moment when people were like, we actually need to work out a system for improving ethical research. We can't just trust people to be ethical. We actually need some rules. And that's where these big conversations about research ethics came to be. Um, however, like everything in social sciences, we filter how we think and talk about research ethics through the paradigm with which we approach research. So starting with positivism, and there's a very important reason we start with positivism because positive research ethics is the research ethics that has given us the system that governs creating ethical research today, right? Um, this is a, I'm, I'm going to show my interpretivist uh, vibes and call it discourse. This is the discourse that we call human subjects research, right? Human subjects research is a category of research that involves interacting with humans or their biological components, right? So you still do human subjects review if you're working on stem cells, for instance. Um, it is a set of principles that are fundamentally the same, whether you are conducting um, biomedical research, psychological research, or, or non-medical social science research, right? Wherever you are on the spectrum, if you interact with humans, you've got to go follow these principles, right? And they are enforceable in the sense that um, your ability to conduct re research under the banner of a university is governed by them. Um, or your ability to receive research funding is, gu is, gu is uh, gu guided by these principles, right? Um, in Canada, for those of us who are in Canada, a human subjects research principles are articulated in the Tri-Council Policy Statement, um, which I highly encourage you to do more reading of. I actually have to say, comparing globally with uh, research ethics frameworks, TCPS is one of, I think, the best in terms of getting at the breadth of ethical issues that are embodied in research. Um, but it's rooted in a positivist epistemology because most approaches to research are rooted in a positivist epistemology. So the positivist approach to research ethics is that you do ethical research by following the rules, 
right? There's a set of rules that make research ethical, right? You don't do things that exploit people. You make sure that people have the ability to consent or refuse to consent. You allow people control over their data insofar as is possible, right? Um, you have to meet a certain standard that the risks need to be outweighed by the benefits of a project, right? And you have to do what you can to minimize risks. Any risks that arise in a project, you have to have a plan for how to make those risks less, right? Um, and so in this paradigm, right, there's a set of rules to follow. So the other thing that's really important to all positivist research, but particularly when thinking about research ethics, is that normative questions are secondary to empirical questions, right? Remember, science is about empirical knowledge. It is not about normative principles, right? For positivists, the normative principles are over here and the empirical principles are over here. There can be some times when there is overlap. For instance, as I'm recording this, there is a kerfluffle happening in American political science because at the upcoming um, American Political Science Association meeting, someone has been invited to speak on a panel organized not by the association, but by a related group who helped write a legal, legal memo that tried to make the attempted coup on January 6th in the US happen, right? Saying that the vice president could refuse to certify the votes of the people and that, pres that President Trump could stay in power. Um, and many political scientists are fairly horrified that this person is being giving a, given a platform despite the fact that most of them are positivists, right? For them, there is, there is a point beyond which this is not merely research about coups. This is trying to start a coup, right? And you can see how that's not science, right? And it's also bad for democracy, but like people have a hard time distinguishing between the two, right? Um, so anyway, you get kind of when normative questions come up, they seem to be external to the product of science. Right, science doesn't get bogged down in this. So there are plenty of people who are writing papers about how people do coups, right? But this guy went so far as to actually say, here's how you, Mr. Vice President, should do a coup. And that's bad, right? And certainly I also think this guy should not be invited to the meeting, but I have a different perspective on it because this is not my paradigm, right? The truly essential thing from a positivist point of view is that, um, our job as researchers is to present true facts. It doesn't matter if we like them or not, right? Um, you know, and this is an issue because people sometimes are very invested in what the right answer for something is, right? Um, you really think it should be that such a thing that you're imagining is happening, right? And it's not happening, right? Or you believe that people should feel a certain way and they're not feeling a certain way, right? And the point from a positive point of view is that that doesn't matter, right? What matters is what is. Remember, positivists believe in objective knowledge, right? If you don't like it, then that's a normative question to talk about in a different circumstance, right? So like, if something is undermining democracy, right? We can care about that with our normative hats on, but we don't get to say it doesn't undermine democracy because we don't want it to, right? That sort of dialogue goes on. Now, post-positivists have different core principles, right? They also believe that you have ethical duties in research. They also believe that you have to behave ethically towards the people you are conducting research with, but they frame the whole debate differently, right? And it's important to recognize that non-positivists also have to adhere to human subjects rules, right? So even if they're like, but my principles suggest something different, they still actually have to like go through the committee process and get their rules laid out for them, right? Um, and part of the reason I said TCPS is better than some is because TCPS actually says, hey, different types of research require different ethics review. Right. Um, however, it's still from within that framework, but it's a little easier to work if, if you have some acknowledgement of difference. So 
Um, I'm grouping critical realists and interpretivists together here because honestly, there's not a lot of difference between them on research ethics. Other issues, absolutely, there's, there's a lot of difference between them, but not when you're doing research ethics. So for a post-positivist, what makes research ethical is context determined, right? You don't have a single abstract principle. So to give you an example from my own research as a non-positivist researcher, right? In some projects I've conducted, it is absolutely imperative that perfect confidentiality be treated around the people who are in a research project. There might be a risk to them. They might not want their opinions to be known, right? Everybody in my book who is not a public figure is referred to by a pseudonym, right? Everybody, because I wanted to protect their identities, right? On the contrary, I'm working on another project where it's incredibly important that we name who the people are who are participating in this project, right? That we give them credit because we are sharing their knowledge and to only share their knowledge without their name is to steal that from them, right? Um, and that's unjust. And so that combination, right, is the balance that you need to strike as a non-positivist, right? Is you need to say, is now a time for confidentiality or is now a time for attribution, right? You answer different questions, right, as you're going about the process. Um, it's also, non-positivists frequently conduct research for normative reasons, right? This doesn't mean you fake the answers to get what you want, right? But so for instance, a lot of people who work on say feminist topics will investigate questions related to women's representation in politics. They take it as for granted that it is a good thing when women are appropriately represented in politics, right? But then they ask, what encourages this? What have been the experience of women in politics, right? And then they try to ask the question, what might make the problems we see better, right? So that's normatively driven. And in fact, there are positivists who kind of accept that kind of normative drive, right? But um, it, it kind of, the emphasis is where you kind of lay the weight of the problem there. So some key concepts that come up in non-positivist and post-positivist research ethics that are less likely to come up in positivist. Positivists have picked up some of this stuff, which is good because it's actually quite important, but their traditional paradigm doesn't allow for it. Um, the first is subjectivity, right? Remember, positivists believe in objective knowledge. Critical realists and interpretivists do not. So what's very important is to account for subjectivity, right? Account for the social location of both researcher and researched, right? Both exist in a relationship, right? I write a lot about members of ethnic minority communities. So I tell people I'm white like a thousand times in everything I write, because it actually really matters if I'm telling somebody said something, it matters that they told it to a white person, right? I also talk about my relationships with people because it actually, you need to know that I'm not a stranger in some of these contexts, right? That's a kind of much more micro level dynamic, but that's an important part of it. The next is that there's a lot of attention to power, right? Both positivists and post-positivists agree that researchers have power in certain circumstances, right? What they believe is that there's different ways to deal with it, right? Positivists try to seed some back, back some of that power through consent documents and a uh, possibility of withdrawal and things like that. Non-positivists believe that it's actually very important to have the people being researched be part of determining what their own boundaries are, right? So rather than predetermining their boundaries, you ask them what their boundaries are, right? On the ethics form that I'm for the project I mentioned where we, we cite people's names and we attribute their knowledge to them, they have a series of ticky boxes where they can say how they want to be attributed, right? Or they can choose video, audio, or text only, right? Because I want to give them the power to control that information. And the last really important point is reflexivity. Um, reflexivity means that researchers don't just take, 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 and then disappear, right? You maintain a relationship with people. And very importantly, um, you kind of think back on what you're doing, right? So 
you might find that conducting research on a given topic is really challenging, right? Or you might find that you being there as a researcher actually stops things from happening that would be good for the people you're researching. And sometimes that actually means to step out. Sometimes it also means you don't get to stay in an ivory tower as a researcher. Sometimes it means you are, you are asked to step forward and do things for people, right? So to be reflexive is to understand where you are sitting and to think about power, right? And also to think about what you can give back. And so these sorts of norms are deeply embedded for post-positivists, even though they don't share much with these kind of traditional approaches to, uh, to human subjects research.